So if that wasn't already enough challenges to look at, which Paul very clearly described, so the, the really important steps and priorities, I'm also going to add uh, to the challenge, and it's thinking about infrastructure, and infrastructure really underpins all what we do. And a lot of the time we forget about it, we think it will always be there to serve us, but if we don't think as a community, and community I mean researchers, libraries, uh, and funders, if we don't as a community think about how to fund that infrastructure, it may not be there to support the policy work that we are now implementing the services. So that's why I'm here today to talk about how important this is, um, talking about how to fund open science infrastructure as a community. And we're in our very early steps with this. Uh, uh, we'll talk to you. Yes. <laughs> so my slides get the applause. Yes. <laughs> So I really believe that it's high time that we re rethink about how we pay for open science infrastructure. Often we're really focused on our subscription fees. Uh, we are also um, very glad to be part of open access or open science projects where we acquire money, but what about spending money on infrastructure together? So let me just tell you something very briefly about Spark Europe, because maybe some of you don't know us yet. So the key goal is making open the default, uh, which is quite a, a challenge in itself, um, and helping ensure that open access and open uh, science is really fully realized. Um, so if you, if you look at this uh, picture here, what, what we're doing is we're working on creating a climate in which open research and education thrives. Ah, oh, can you hear me all right? I usually have quite a loud voice anyway, so. <laughs> Um, so what we're really looking at, so if we think about policy or infrastructure, it's having a healthy soil here with good nutrients, no poisons, uh, good fertilizers, making sure that it's watered well. And so without that, we cannot grow our open access, open science, provide access to our research. So we are trying to work on providing the good conditions for that, and infrastructure belongs to that. So what we're doing is we focus very much on driving policy, European policy. Uh, we're looking at uh, legislation that's being developed on copyright reform at the moment, on the public sector information, so providing access to research data more effectively, and also at the new European, the large European funding program, FP9, to make sure that there's an open access and open science mandate that supports our work. We are also... <coughs> supporting policy development um, amongst uh, uh, nations um, and funders. So we're also looking at what funders in Europe, uh, what kind of open access and open science policies do they have in place? Oh, really? No, they're not standing. No, no, they're not those two things. Um, could you hear me all right? Yes. yes, okay, right, thanks. Um, and we also do some policy reporting in Europe on research data, so we give updates on national policy uh, development, so that if you're thinking of developing your own national policy, you can look at uh, others. Uh, we also provide advocacy guidance and tools, that's essential to our work as well, so it's not just policy work, uh, and cultural change as uh, Paul was talking about what's really important is also how do you engage between your researchers and libraries to create change and get the researchers to actually move that uh, for you. So we, we like activities in that area. And the last, last but not least, what I'm talking about today is about supporting the sustainability of open infrastructure. We talked, I think uh, Paul already talked about Plan S, and I think I'll swiftly run through that how we are supporting it. Yes. Um, we also came up with 10 ways how libraries can support the implementation of Plan S so that we can help influence what that looks like um, and how libraries can engage uh, with funders to make this happen. So, <clears throat> right. So I think, and also that, that goes for your country too, 
there's been a lot of uh, development in policy. We, we have a lot to be thankful for, for all the hard work that a lot of us have put into on a, on a, 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 a European level on um, developing uh, open access and open science policies. So on the European level with the Competitiveness Council where all the ministers of industry and research signed up to make research openly available by 2020. Um, there are national policies uh, developed, uh, funded policies, uh, yourselves, you just launched <coughs> a policy and congratulations with that, that will support you no end I'm sure. Uh, and in, uh, institutional policies, my last count was so about 600 in Europe. Um, so, <coughs> uh, now, but with policies, so without extra funding or without thinking about the funding of policy, um, and also uh, it's, it's important that we need to think about that we really need to have a stable infrastructure to enable us to implement that policy. Yes. Um, so there are some additional costs that come with that. And either the funders give us additional <coughs> money, or we have to also reshuffle some of our budgets, which is, at the moment, we need a mix, and this is new, and we are looking at different business models and how to approach funding right now. But I think we need to also, as a community, um, to take responsibility for upholding a, a, a strong infrastructure that will support our work. So if we think about what's been happening over the years, a lot of this have been funded by short-term project funding. So there's been a lot of uh, money uh, put into developing services, repositories, etc. Um, and there's been a very large um, offering of scholarly communication solutions developed by libraries, but also by researchers. Um, I think many of you will know this 101 on innovative tools and sites in six research workflow phases. Sorry, it's a bit of a long, big mouthful there. But you can see the range of um, scholarly communication tools that have been developed over the years. And some of those have survived, a lot of them have. Um, but we also need to think about, <coughs> so there is a huge plethora of services and some of those infrastructure that supports our work. Um, and some of those have been in existence for a number of years. They started off as projects and built on business models that maybe today aren't working uh, for them and where they are concerned about their, their financial future because that project funding has run out and other seed funding, etc. So it's thinking about those services that we depend upon um, and why is it important? If we think about publisher or company diversification, if you think about the Elseviers, uh, but also Microsoft, who purchased GitHub a couple of weeks ago, I don't know whether you know that. So there are some quite some concerns that we want to remain independent, we want to look after some of this essential infrastructure that it's not bought up by, necessarily, commercial companies whose main focus is profit making rather than our mission oriented um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, goals as institutions to serve uh, research and society. So it's really important, so how can we um, try to prevent this movement uh, from, from getting out of hand and take some responsibility uh, in that. So my four signposts, <coughs> before I show you some of the work that's going on in this area, what we really need is a fair and stable and sustainable scholarly communication infrastructure. We don't want an imbalanced commercial exploitation of science through open access. There's no longer a place for monopolies to call the shots, right? So we need to take this as a community more into our own hands as well. And um, how can I get rid of this thing in the corner here? Sorry. <coughs> I can't see a mouse here at all. Oh, help. Um, no. That's a shame. Oops. There's no mouse there. Never mind. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, as I say, we need to take more control over the, uh, our scholarly communications. And there is a real need 
than for a European regulatory body. I, I've been told by the head of policy uh, at the European Commission that they are working on this. So that's good news, but that's in the background. And I'm not just going to sit quietly and hope for the best. Yes? So I think that we can take some collective action now. Um, so, <clears throat> right, that's what I've been saying. So, <clears throat> just like we perhaps at home, we have, we have our savings for gas, for electricity, etc. I think what we also need to do, if we are working on open access and open science, we also need to set aside funds for that infrastructure that supports our work. And to see that that is a necessary spend. I know it's difficult because our, our budgets are often really very stretched, but we need to think about how can we even fill this pot just a little bit, yes, and increase that over time. And if all of us do that, then we can contribute significantly to the, the costs of infrastructure. So what we can also do is support a number of business models. So there are a number of collective funding mechanisms. Uh, you've got the Open Library of Humanities, some of you may have heard, so how you uh, collectively as libraries pay to unlock um, uh, journal articles in, 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 in uh, the humanities sector. You've also got uh, Knowledge Unlatch that also does something similar for journals, but also books and for some services. Um, <clears throat> so where a number of organisations put money in a pot and then they contribute to the funding or unlocking of, of open access. Uh, and you've got other <coughs> models, different models. Uh, Archive.org, as we know, <coughs> is an essential uh, service. Um, and has been running for many, many years. But they have a very interesting business model here where you have um, many members uh, signing up for a number of five years, certain amount of dollars, thousands of dollars per year, but they also have match funding by a particular funder who matches that amount of funding and there's money from the institution. So it's a mixed model so that they remain sustainable. So we need to look at some of those uh, models where we're building our own services, so to help sustain them, but also to put money into some of these services to help collectively fund those, right? Um, and there is actually quite, it's, uh, we've been in this game probably only since last year, or the beginning of last year, but this year there's been a, quite a boom to really look <coughs> at investing in open infrastructure. <coughs> We've got Spark North America that is looking at the diversification of services amongst um, various publishers and then to bring this knowledge to the research community and for us to learn about what are our opportunities, what are the threats and where could we invest in the longer term. Um, you've also got the 2.5% commitment move movement or invest in open. Um, that is uh, <coughs> it's somebody called David Lewis last year who said maybe libraries should spend, should put aside 2.5% of their library budgets to spend on open science. The 2.5%, it turned out, wasn't really such a, a great number pulled out of the air, but it's for us to think about should we earmark a certain amount for investing in open science? Yes, that's what I need. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've been the annoying one coughing already, if this doesn't make it easier. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> so that's top slicing library budget. So that's also a way of us to think about how can we fund um, <coughs> and how they're trying to approach this is by looking at what is key infrastructure? What is the ecosystem? What are we talking about? And also asking US institutions, how much are you spending? Right? So, um, so that's an interesting project to look out for. That will be finished, I think, by the end of next year. But that helps inform libraries to think more about what they're already investing and what should they be investing in. Now, 
the joint roadmap for open science tools, JROS. Has anybody heard of them yet? They're very new. Okay, excellent. I'm glad I'm telling you at least one thing that's new. <laughs> so <clears throat> JROS is really exciting. It's called the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools. It's uh, led by a US uh, institution. I think a number of these are known to you, Mozilla, Hypothesis, <coughs> uh, you've got DataSite and, <coughs> and others. Um, and it's looking at the ecosystem of open science tools and how can they work better together? Perhaps with open protocols. Also, how can you strengthen some of these? Some of these are startups, some of these are a bit longer standing institutions. How can they be strengthened as organizations? What does a good governance structure look like? So that's really important if you think about a solid organization that takes something forward into the future. How do they manage? What business models are they built on? Can they learn from each other to strengthen business models? So this is a great space to have those conversations with a number of open science tools right, that are serving us. Okay? This is not so much about funding, although that is a topic. Um, but that's an exciting development, so please watch that space. Operas, how about operas? Who's heard of them? A couple of people, yes. So this is really exciting because they are also looking at the whole ecosystem of information providers, service providers in the area of social sciences and humanities and looking at what it also means to um, pay the way, pay the costs together, and develop excellent services together in a group. So it's distributed, but shared services, and more effectively working together to develop those, but also to fund them, all right? So it's looking at funding the whole ecosystem to serve a large discipline, right? I think that's really exciting, that's the way to go. So th this has been built on a couple of EU projects, but they are actually going to establish an organization shortly. Uh, so also watch that space, please. <coughs> now, how about this one? Human Frontier Science Program, maybe also new. Um, so this is a very interesting initiative. This is where a number of funders, international funders, um, <coughs> expressed concern that they were worried about uh, certain, certain essential uh, databases, the genome database and others, that they need to be there in years to come. How are they going to ensure that those essential research resources, mainly data resources, will be there in the future? And what they're looking to do, they're working on a, on a business plan now, as far as I know, how can they collectively put money aside in their, so their funders, in their funding budgets, to ensure that money goes into sustaining those services, right? And this is for the life sciences. So just before we were looking at here, yeah, this is a lot of publishers, libraries, uh, research communities, but this is funders, right? Looking at how they can pay the way forward to support open research. So I think that's also a very interesting development, again, for a discipline. <coughs> um, and then another group, so myself included, and Jay Ross and others are quite passionate about moving this forward, about advocating for funding open science. So we have formed a group that's called Invest in Open Infrastructure, where we are um, sharing experiences, and we all want to uh, sing from the same hymn sheet. I don't know whether you know. Do you have an expression like that here? You kind of, or at least you're reading from the same page. You're on the same, oh, oh I've got my own English. Anyway, you're on the same page, yeah? You know what you're all talking about. So we're also thinking about messaging, which is the same. We all go out when we're, you know. There are different parts to funding. And I'm going to uh, talk about one part, and this is Scots, okay? So, I've probably got, have I got 10 minutes or so? Sorry, who's timekeeping? At least yes, 10 minutes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. Oh, I'm going to use that one minute also uh, to my advantage. <coughs> so, SCOS. So, SCOS. This, has anybody, who's heard about SCOS? Few of you. Okay. Right. Well, more of you now. I hope, <coughs> I hope it will stick. So, 
SCOS is an initiative that was born a couple of years ago, and Spark Europe has been coordinating this, uh, helping sustain open science infrastructure. Cameron Leland, so if there's anything that you'd like to read, a little bit of background reading, please read Cameron Leland's Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure. It's a really excellent paper. And he said that if everything we gain by opening content and data will be under threat if we allow the, the enclosure of scholarly infrastructures. So we, that's not, we don't want this enclosure. We want to ensure that that remains open. So what is SCOPS? It's an open science community of organizations that promote essential infrastructure, recommending certain services that <coughs> need funding to help them forward on the road to, to sustainability. Um, it's asking the crowd to help fund those. So, <coughs> the current SCOS members are, they are large networks representing the library community <laughs> and the research community, uh, mainly library at the moment. So you've got the European Library, uh, Research Library Network of Viva, you've got the Council of Australian University Librarians, you've got IFL, that represents <coughs> across continents, um, you've got ourselves, you've got the Association of Research Libraries in the US, so ARL, you've got CARL, which is the Canadian group, and you've got the Association <laughs> of African Universities. So they are behind this initiative. What do we mean by infrastructure? Because it's often... Uh, it's quite a challenging word to explain because lots of the time people have very different uh, um, conceptions of what that is. It provides, <coughs> we define it, open science infrastructure provides the scientific and scholarly communi community with resources and services to access, share and assess research. So those are the kinds of services that we promote <coughs> um, to be funded. So it's been developed by significant players in these various communities, as I've already said. It's a we form a consolidated voice um, <coughs> on your behalf to make some recommendations for funding. And we also evaluate those services quite strictly <coughs> before we recommend them for funding. Um, it also creates a, a framework, so you don't have to do the research yourself to find out what the costs are, what the benefits are for your community, uh, what are the user statistics. We get that for you and we make the informed decision. So it kind of helps also investors um, <coughs> along the way. And there's also more transparency then on the costs and the funding needed to enable that remuneration. <coughs> What we're also doing is, <clears throat> with this work to support open infrastructure, I'm looking at the various business models and sharing those business models with these services so that in years to come that they're also strengthened um, for the future. Um, we don't uh, support any, any specific discipline um, and they should be non-profit. This is the evaluation criteria. So before anything is recommended for funding, they need to provide this information, technical details, what's the value proposition for which kind of communities, uh, what are the costs over the last two years and also the coming year, uh, what's your governance structure, um, <coughs> what sustainability measures do you have in place now, and what are your plans. Right, <clears throat> so the key results, you're probably kind of like, oh, this all sounds very nice. But a year, a, a year ago, we went out, so it's the OAJ and Sherpa Romeo for the pilot, okay? So we said to the community about a year ago, thank you, um, the OAJ and Sherpa Romeo are essential services. If you would like to fund them, please go ahead. And the relationship is between you as a funder and that service. We don't collect funds, right? But more than a million <coughs> US dollars has been raised through the community from across the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. Not all continents are involved yet, but still, we are really thrilled with this result. Uh, it's very much largely uh, down to uh, 
uh, DOAJ, who's been doing lots of advocacy <coughs> on this. Um, but it shows that if you get the community together, um, um, a lot can be achieved, right? Uh, I think I already talked about, <coughs> so, yeah, maybe I should, but I haven't really got time to talk about capacity, I'll do but perhaps over the lunch. Um, and it's really about changing the mindset amongst libraries. IPOLC, so IPOLC represents the world's library consortia. This has been on the agenda for the last two IPOLC meetings, which is really fantastic. We never thought that. We told them about SCOS, they, uh, one of our members presented SCOS, and then they wanted in the next meeting to also talk about SCOS and investing in open infrastructure. So we hope this is going to be a regular theme and that this trickles down to, you know, all consortia for them to think about, yes, we need to invest here. Okay. Um, right. So this, is, uh, this shows actually the funding by continent at the moment. So Europe has actually caught up quite a bit uh, before it was quite heavy on North America. Um, and the, the top countries that are still is United States, <coughs> Norway, Australia, Sweden, Canada, Germany. So we are not there yet, but that could change. And it doesn't have to be investing huge amounts. If we all, we do make some recommendations on um, funding levels, and maybe that's one of the challenges we've had. But um, here we can see that DOAJ almost has, 75, has reached 75% uh, percent of its target. So, as I say, the challenge has been also the pricing model. It's been quite high. We have recommended for uh, large organisations um, a fee which is, could be considered high, but it's not compared to archive, for example, is higher, right? But you can also contribute less, and there's negotiations there, but it's to reach this target as quickly as possible. That's why the fees have been higher. And it's been an experiment. So we're evaluating the program now. Uh, yes. On. Right. The good news is that we've had two services that uh, we've been promoting for funding. We published a call in, uh, about six weeks ago asking the community, okay, who else, right, who else needs um, uh, support in, in uh, support financial support to help them on the road to sustainability, uh, and we had 36 uh, expressions of interest coming, right, from all around the world except for Asia and South America. But so that's really interesting. So now we have the challenge to filter down, and then um, those expressions of interest that fit in with our definition of infrastructure etc. of international interest, we will then ask them to officially apply and send in a, a bigger application form for next year. Um, so what you can do, <coughs> sorry, I'm slightly running over time, I think that's probably okay, just a couple of minutes. So what you can do yourselves is think about pledging for open access and open science infrastructure within your institution, talk about it in your consortium, your national or regional ones, and within your community. Do think about perhaps contributing to Chevrolet Romeo or DOHA, however small, yes? Um, and help promote that this is an important cause. Um, <clears throat> so the, the three calls to action is also as I was saying, explore and invest in different business models, so sharing the burden, yes, to sustain your <coughs> services as well, and to pay into the current ones. Um, raise awareness of the need for collective action, that's what I've been talking about in your community, and also really strive to consistently invest in open science. This is not, not a, a one-time thing. It's really to think about a responsibility to make this a budget post, you know, for years to come. So, please join that, that community, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much.